back to episode 13 of the Double Down Podcast presented by Waterwave. Today is Friday, December 16th, and I'm excited to be joined in the studio with a special guest. But before we get to that amazing interview, we need to hit the Double Down weekly wrap-up. So for the weekly wrap-up, uh, I mentioned to you guys last week about just dealing with some knee pain post-surgery. Um, some, of, some of the things that you know, people don't really understand through uh, you know, an ACL and, and lateral and medial meniscus surgery is uh, obviously the knee's going to hurt, but uh, you're going to have other things uh, like your hamstring, like your quad, like your calf, like your hip. Uh, it's going to kind of flare up and it's going to kind of, you know, just cause you discomfort. It comes with growing the muscle back and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of what I've been dealing with um, in terms of my rehab. Um, and that means a lot of dry needling. Uh, for those of you that haven't done dry needling before, um, basically what our, our trainer does, he puts a, a needle about three, four inches into my hip, into my quad, uh, into my hamstring, kind of just to loosen, loosen up some muscle, get the muscle uh, working again. Um, just trying to basically relieve some of the pressure that I've been feeling in my hip. Um, like, like, like I mentioned before, you know, it's, it's nothing, nothing too major, uh, but it's something we definitely want to, you know, stay on top of so I can keep, keep getting in the weight room and, and keep getting stronger in terms of my knee. Um, next for the weekly wrap up, we're gonna hit some go for basketball news. Um, like I mentioned last week, we're kind of in a little bit of a slum right now, you know, just lost a couple games in a row and uh, we're just looking to bounce back. Um, as I mentioned before, we pre-record episodes. Uh, so today is actually Wednesday and then we play tonight versus Arkansas Pine Bluff. Um, so hopefully we got to see you guys at the game. Hopefully a lot of you came to the game, um, spent time to get down to the barn and check us out. Um, and lastly, um, you know, not a whole lot of news this week, but you know, it's, uh, it's Christmas time. It's getting into Christmas time. So um, just enjoying the weather. Uh, semester is ending up. Um, so uh, we've actually had some pretty nice weather here in Minnesota for all my non-Minnesota listeners. It's been mid-30s all week, which is not very normal for us. So uh, definitely something to note, uh, definitely something we want to mention. Um, but that's all I have for this week's Double Down Weekly Wrap-Up. Uh, and stick with us as we're going to head to our featured interview. Today I'm excited to be joining the studio with this year's Big Ten Volleyball Player of the Year, Taylor Landfair. Taylor, thank you for joining me today. Um, thanks for coming on the pod. You know, I've uh, spent a lot of time coming to games this year and, and just watching you guys. Um, from a team standpoint, it's, you guys are just such a fun team to watch. Uh, such a fun team. Uh, just your camaraderie. I think volleyball is really unique in that way, too, where it's like you have such a fun camaraderie within the team. And it's 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 enjoyable to watch. And I think it's it's almost inspirational to some other teams. It's like to see the way you guys interact with one another. Mm -hmm. And it's always so positive and so uplifting. It's it's. It's definitely a special thing. Um, you know, I bet volleyball has been a part of your life for a long time. You know, I saw you grew up with three siblings. I'm sure you were always active in sports. Um, when did you kind of realize that, like, volleyball was, was what you want to do? Volleyball is something, like, I can make a career out of. Was it, like, at a really young age, or, or was it kind of, like, going into high school? How did that kind of process go about for you? So when I first started off with all these kind of different sports, I did, like, dance, I did cheer, mm -hmm. soccer, basically all the sports you kind of could think of. Yeah. And so then I really kind of sold with – First of all, I did cheer for a really long time, and okay. I really loved cheer. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, I got a little bit too tall for that. <laughs> and then I did basketball just because my dad coached basketball. Yeah. And then I was also, of course, tall. So then he yeah. was like, well, let's try basketball. Let's kind of see. Bit. Exactly. Yeah. And then he also played basketball. So then he kind of was like my coach for a little bit. But then after I realized, I was like, I don't really like the contact. I don't really like people pushing me around, touching yeah. me. And that's not really like my <laughs> vibe. So then I was like, okay, well, what kind of sport can I do next? That's also really good for tall people. And so my mom played volleyball all throughout mm -hmm. high school. And then she wanted to play in college, but she chose track instead. Gotcha. And so she's like, okay, well, let me just try and introduce you to volleyball, kind of give you the fundamentals, and mm -hmm. then see if you kind of like it. And if you don't, that's fine. But let's just yeah. see if you do. And then I started in fifth grade with her. Okay. And that's when I started volleyball. And okay. I loved it. Then, yeah. There. So you probably fell, fell in love right away, mm -hmm. uh, realized it was something you kind of wanted to do. Yeah. Um, how did that because I, I know it's different for for girls and guys with high school kind of recruiting process when did you kind of start getting recruited for volleyball when did you know like you were legit you know like gonna be able to basically pick where you wanted to go to college or play volleyball how did that kind of go down for you when you probably into high school or was it even so, younger than that I got recruited in seventh grade Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> so I started getting letters in seventh grade wow. but my mom didn't really let me look at those letters because mm -hmm. she was like you need to focus on volleyball especially yeah. because you only started a yeah. year ago mm -hmm. so she's like okay let's just focus on volleyball I'll read the letters and then she's like when you actually get to be in ninth grade then you can kind of get more involved into your recruiting process yeah. so then during ninth yeah. grade I got more in involved gotcha yeah so I mean it's it's a fun time too but it's I think I think that's a cool thing that your mom did because it's like mm -hmm. hey let's let's get through middle school let's focus on school and then and then we'll pick from there which is which is unique yeah. um 
you know, you get into high school, get into ninth grade. Um, obviously, you, you're on track to, to be a pretty good high school volleyball player. Um, when did Minnesota reach out? When did, you know, you kind of start forming that connection with Minnesota? And then ultimately you picked to come to the University of Minnesota. Take us through that kind of process and your decision making and, and why you decided to come, come north and, and be a gopher. Mm -hmm. So in ninth grade, I kind of started looking at more of the top mm -hmm. schools within the Big Ten. So I was looking at for sure Wisconsin, Nebraska, and then here. Yeah. And so then I went on a visit my in ninth grade to each place and over the summer. Mm -hmm. And then I also had the camps with each school. Okay. And so what really stood out to me about Minnesota was the camp, especially because he really wanted to form a relationship with me, even though I was only in ninth grade. It just yeah. felt like he really wanted to form that connection with me kind of right off the bat, even yeah. before I did, if I chose to come here. Mm -hmm. And then also after that, I really didn't like the other schools technically just because like it really wasn't that team feel and I also yeah. feel like the coaches really didn't want to involve me into the process as much as Hugh did yeah and so then I took three visits actually to each school just like kind of finalized that I really wanted mm -hmm. to come here and then my junior year is when I was here on my last visit and out of nowhere I was just like I think I want to come here so my mom me and my mom that night before because we were gonna leave that next morning mm -hmm. and we came up with like a pros and cons list and then that next morning I was like I want to come here and then I committed yeah that's special I think Thanks. it's I think it's um it's such a unique thing too where you kind of knew even mm -hmm. from the jump you know going to camps you knew yeah, and, exactly. and we could throw a little Wisconsin shade because we're not Wisconsin <laughs> fans on this podcast but no. no it's um you know I think it's a special thing when you go somewhere and you're like you know this is kind of the spot for me and I'm yeah. sure you started forming you know after you commit you sure you started forming relationships with some of the girls coming in girls mm -hmm. on the team and it's like that that kind of that family atmosphere mm -hmm. I think is so special especially when you're trying to pick you know where you want to go to college I was talking to one of one of the basketball players I trained growing up and he's kind of in his process right now of trying to pick and I'm like dude go somewhere that like makes you feel welcome mm -hmm. go somewhere that wants you makes you feel fit and yeah, it's, uh, exactly. I think that's such a such a special thing um, you know you had such a illustrious high school career uh, you're ranked as the number one prospect um, in the country you're Under Armour first team All-American um, in, in you just have a you know a great career so you're, you're playing at a very high level of of um, of volleyball how did that help prepare you for the Big Ten uh, you know obviously the Big Ten is the best volleyball league in the country how did your high school career and your club level kind of just prepare you to get ready for you know what is really good volleyball in the Big Ten so I think it was really helpful because my high school coach was also a coach at my club oh, wow. and so kind of he first when I started in sixth grade he I actually went to one of the high school camps mm -hmm. just to kind of get into like the mix of like what high school volleyball would look like all that kind of stuff and so he's like well I actually coach at this specific club and I think it's the best club within this whole entire area oh, wow. so I think it'd be really cool if you maybe came out there and maybe I can do a lesson with you or you mm -hmm. can come to our tryouts or something kind of around those lines and so then I was like okay let me just talk to my mom about it so my mom kind of got in contact with him and then we got into contact to the director of my club and so then after that I was kind of just like a, a tumble effect where I start, did high school with him yeah. and then I also did club afterwards and yeah. I think that's it like a, really prepared me. So yeah, that's a unique story too, because I don't think a lot of times. I mean, pre, me personally, you don't have you have different coaches for you know high school and, mm -hmm. and club and that kind of yeah, stuff, exactly. and and sometimes they butt heads even too and mm -hmm. stuff. But it made made that kind of seamless for you. Yeah. Um, you come in and you early enroll, correct? Mm -hmm. You you ended up coming to Minnesota early. Kind of take us through like expectations you have coming into Minnesota. Obviously. You, you have confidence in your game. You know you're a good player. Uh, but this is another level. You know, obviously you've played on USA Volleyball. You've played on a world stage. But, you know, girls are taller. You know, girls right. are faster. Girls are stronger. How did you kind of, you know, take those expectations into Minnesota? And how did they kind of form in that, that first year where it's like you're supposed to be a senior in high school still? Right. So when I first came here, I was really confident because I did the All-American thing. Mm -hmm. I did, like, a whole high school. Yeah. And I was really good in high school. did it whatever that kind of like held up for me, I guess. And mm -hmm. so when I came here and everybody was a lot taller than me, like you said, they were yeah. a lot stronger and I was like, whoa, like I don't know necessarily if I can fit in right now. Mm -hmm. And so kind of like that whole process of like, I guess, like undermining myself and just yeah. kind of like not having all that confidence that I had before in high school, mm -hmm. which was really hard. And so I always had to talk to the upperclassmen, especially like Adana and Stephanie, mm -hmm. and just letting them know that like, hey, I'm struggling in this kind of moment and like, what can you do to help me out? And they were really helpful with me just because like it was just a really yeah. hard process for me and especially because like I wasn't getting as many kills and I wasn't doing like great with passing and all that kind yeah. of stuff and so it was just really hard at that time well that's such a that's such a unique thing too where it's like I don't think a lot of freshmen are able to you know even admit that you know yeah. coming in where it's like oh you know I was I was a five star I was a four star like I was tough like I'm gonna be tough but like right it's okay to be like, okay, this is tougher. You know, mm -hmm. this is like, and reach out to upperclassmen, like, hey, how do I get through this? Obviously, Steph Samadji is, you know, a great resource for mm -hmm. you. You know, yeah. she was big time player of the year as well. So mm -hmm. it's like, you're coming in and it's not like you're lost. You have these resources. Right. It's like, don't be afraid to use them. And I think that's something that, 
um, you know, younger kids and, and lower class when they need to know coming into college where it's like, dude, it's like, it's okay to like yeah. not know, you know, but, mm-hmm. but ask and then work to, to, you know, to get better and right. fix that kind of thing. Um, and it works for you, you know, you come in and, um, you know, in the 2021 spring season, you have a, you have a great year, uh, freshman, all big 10 team, uh, two time fresh, big 10 freshman of the week. Um, you had 20 kills in, in the game against Maryland. Like, you know, you're, you're getting these kills back. You're, you're coming back right. and, and you're that player that you knew you were, um, but there was no fans, right? right. COVID hindered fans yeah. kind of take us through, cause I don't think we really tapped on, tapped into on the podcast, like the real difference. Mm-hmm. Cause you're coming to Minnesota, right? You're coming to the path, the best yeah, place exactly, to play college right. basketball. I mean, college volleyball. Mm-hmm. Um, how did, how did no fans kind of hinder just like the atmosphere of play and, and, and for you and your teammates? I think it was weird because in practice we would kind of put over the audio like the sound of a yeah, crowd yeah. trying to just simulate that but it just wasn't anything in comparison and mm-hmm. so when we actually got to matches it was just weird because we had to be the ones that kind of generated all the energy and we really yeah. couldn't feed off of anything mm-hmm. except for ourselves which was hard just because it was kind of like it was a neutral site for both yeah. teams and you really couldn't feed anything and so I think that just kind of prepared us for the future just because this helped us build so much energy and then we can also bring even more energy now mm-hmm. and then also when it comes time to actually play with fans and it's just like it's just easier yeah it's just second nature and i think that's such a unique thing too and i think it's like i mentioned before in volleyball it's you know it's you guys create your own energy you know especially when you you go on the road and you got to play at nebraska or you got to play at wisconsin like it's not like there's a couple thousand like there's fifteen thousand people there and it's like nobody wants you to win if you're in the coal center and you're playing wisconsin so it's like you have to create that own energy you Mm -hmm. have to you know be able to trust the person to your nexus maybe you can't even hear them you know and it's uh it's such a big, it's such a big thing. And, um, you know, we talked about adjustments, um, for you, what, what would you say kind of was your biggest adjustment from high school to that freshman year of, of, of volleyball, um, for you as a player? Cause obviously, you know, you, you don't want to change who you are. You want to stick to your game. Um, but what kind of adjustments did you have to make that you kind of realized maybe like throughout the season, like, Hey, this is what I need to do. Maybe I need to, you know, fix this, fix that. How did you kind of adjust as a freshman? So I think the way that my club taught us, we they taught us more of the Japanese type of way when it comes to volleyball. Okay. But then when I came here, we taught more of the USA way. Yeah. And so it just kind of is different technique, that, like where your leg is when you pass or where your arm is when you hit and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so I really had to make those changes and just take that as a learning experience rather than thinking like, oh, I'm this player. Like I was all this kind of in high school, so I don't yeah. really need to make any changes. Mm-hmm. But instead embrace those changes because my coaches are here telling me what they need me to do because I can be like yeah. this person in the future. And yeah. I can like make those changes because they are inefficiencies is what we call them and so when I change these I can kind of be more of like that pro player in the future yeah I think that's such a unique thing especially with a coach like you know Hugh who's obviously knows the game really well Mm -hmm. because coached it for for a long time and it's like you know the kind of system you want to run and it only works if everybody gets on board so it's like I think it's something that we're kind of dealing with too and I think a lot of teams deal with it it's like you got to have everybody on board to to the kind of plan that you have and you know it worked out for you You had an awesome freshman year um you know you were all-american honorable mention um and you know you end that season and you head into your sophomore year after a great freshman year like where is your head at in terms of in terms of volleyball like how how excited are you to to hopefully play in front of fans you know how like where are you going um obviously you had a great year you want to have another great year um what kind of mindset did you take into your sophomore year I think I really just embraced the fact that, like, one, we could have fans, but then mm-hmm. also, two, really fans couldn't see what we had. Yeah. And I feel like they really couldn't see, like, beyond mm-hmm. a screen yeah. of, like, the amount of work that we put in and the amount of energy that we had and the amount of chemistry that we were building. And I just feel like we kind of just all took that into consideration and be like, hey, like, this is what we can do. Like, these are our goals. This is our standard. And we need to make sure that we're met with our standard and making sure that everybody's on the same exact play, just like you said. Yeah, no, and it's such a unique thing where it's like you're allowing people to come back and play an extra year, and it's it's an exciting thing, especially for, for a team like Minnesota who has so much depth, who every year is going to bring in a freshman who's, you know, obviously right. a legit player, mm-hmm. you know. So um, you obviously you head into that year, and, and you uh, you guys opened up with Texas at home, right? I think, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was at that game. I was remember I was like, because this is my first time at the U, mm-hmm. uh, first, first year, and I was like, dude, I – I've been watching uh, Minnesota volleyball. Like, I obviously know the excitement that mm-hmm. comes with the PAV. Like, I was there an hour early in the front row, like mm-hmm. excited to watch you guys. Kind of just take us through. Like, you probably got chills running mm-hmm. up there. You probably heard the fans before. The, I mean, before it even started. Take us through like the excitement it is to play in the PAV and like how cool it is to like have people come out and like really support you and like watch and, and love watching you do what you do. So kind of like our whole like pregame ritual is like where we stand inside 
the locker room and then we give each other like high fives and then mm-hmm. we kind of just do like a Minnesota shout or shout and then like normally I really didn't have the experience of like what it is hearing yeah. those fans when you're actually standing in the locker room uh-huh. and so I was just standing in the locker room and I was like whoa like yeah. I can hear every single like little every single sound it was like the coolest thing I've actually ever experienced in my life and so then we were actually able to break and then we went out there I kind of just was like whoa yeah. I was just looking around everybody was up on their feet you could see maroon and gold all like it was a sea of maroon and gold and it was just so cool just because I've never been able to experience ex- experience that before mm-hmm. and so just being there with my teammates and we were just like we need to like show yeah. exactly what these fans have been missing mm-hmm. all throughout these two years and so it was i don't know i yeah. just like gave me chills no just no doubt about it i was just yeah. like it's crazy no and i think that's such a unique thing where it's like it's such a cool thing in college because it's like it's okay to take a step and just kind of look around and be yeah. like dang like you know i worked for this you know mm-hmm. i earned this there's a reason why i'm here um and you go into that texas game which was you know a, a phenomenal match uh, with texas um you guys had him on the ropes a uh, c- couple times actually, yeah. and it was it was just a fun it was a fun game. The energy in there was was live, um, and you kind of you kind of have a little you know a little pain in that game. Uh, <laughs> kind of just take us through just just that game before we kind of dive deeper into um, what happened. Uh, just playing in that Texas game and the kind of pain you felt uh, as you were playing in the game. So when I first started in the first set, I was feeling good, like really pumped about it, really excited, and I knew that kind of like two weeks prior, I did hurt that part of my body a little bit yeah. but I kind of just pushed it to the side because I was thinking oh this is probably just me being sore or mm-hmm. I might have did something that just tweaked it a little bit but it will go away yeah. at some point but then during the second set I was like oh it kind of feels weird because I keep stretching it over rotating it a little bit but I was like I'll yeah. be fine until the game's over Gotcha. so in the third set I was like okay well this kind of hurts a lot and mm-hmm. I was really feeling it a lot more in that time but I was just like I'm not going to say anything I'm just going to fight through because this game will almost be over anyways it's not like I'll be playing for like another day and a half or whatever yeah so then during the fourth set, I remember this one specific point, and I went up to hit, and I came down, and I just over-rotated way too much, mm-hmm. just because the set was a little bit too far behind my head, and like the whole entire thing, I just felt it stretch, yeah. and I just kind of felt like it tore just a little bit, but not too crazy, yeah. and so then I just looked over at my trainer, and she's like, you're done, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, so then I had to go <laughs> to the sideline, and I had to sub out, yeah. and I was so upset about it, and so I went to the locker room with her into the training area, and I just sat on the table, and I just didn't really have any words, because I was like... I, we literally could have won that game like mm-hmm. not necessarily saying that this game is on me yeah. but at the same time like I was thinking if I would have said something those two weeks before and letting her know that I actually was kind of feeling that pain then maybe this wouldn't happen and maybe we could have taken another set off Texas and came up with the win in the fifth set so yeah. there were just a lot of emotions I was kind of going through my head and it was just kind of a lot of negativity but also at the same time I was like I just don't really know what this looks like for me in the future yeah and, it, and it's such a tough thing too with a person that has the level of experience and the level of competitive nature that you have, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, you don't want to be taken out. Right. Like, you know, something's wrong, but it's like, yeah. you got, you would have to drag me out because exactly. I don't, I don't want to be taken out. Like yeah. I want to be out there, help my team win. Um, and you, you talked about those emotions. Let's kind of go into that. Um, obviously you knew you were, you were kind of injured. Something, something was wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously there's probably a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. Um, other than the physical kind of pain and emotions you went through, what kind of, what kind of other emotions just like popped up initially? Like, what were you thinking um, in terms of, of the year, in terms of the moment, like how did, were you able to kind of rationalize those, those un- emotions? Well, there's a game going on right. like 30 feet away from you. Right. So I think like right when I came off, I was kind of just trying to be a little bit more optimistic and a little bit on the positive side yeah. and kind of telling myself like, oh, this is just going to pass. You're fine. Don't even worry about it. Like yeah. we can go on to the next match. You're good. But then at the same time, I was thinking in my head, I was like, well, what if I'm not good? Or what if I can't go to the next game? Or what if I have to stop for the whole entire season? Kind of mm-hmm. what does that look like? Yeah. And so I was kind of explaining those emotions to my trainer. But she's like, don't even worry about that. Like, we're not worrying about that right now. What we're worrying about right now is just instead making sure that you can actually go back on the sideline. Maybe go in if you really feel like you could. Yeah. But just making sure that you're out there supporting your teammates. And so I kind of feel like that really helped me in that moment just to kind of not keep going down on myself even more than I already was Mm -hmm. and so I feel like after kind of like that game was over then all the emotions kind of started pouring out again but I feel like in the moment she kind of like just kept me level-headed yeah well it's such a it's such a tough thing too especially when we're you know we're so competitive as athletes and like we don't want to we don't want to sit out like we want to be in the game you know especially because we've worked so hard for it um and you know you you get through that one that texas game Mm -hmm. and i think if i read it correctly it was in the michigan game which was you know after the um it was after the iowa state game and Mm -hmm. before the before the maryland game Mm -hmm. and that was the kind of game where you played i think you played a half a set um and you kind of explained it to us um what happened in terms of like the physical like actual play of the injury Mm -hmm. um but yeah the michigan game 
half half of the set kind of just take us through that and the kind of pain you felt and, and what happened so in practice that morning I was thinking okay my ab doesn't really hurt that much I'll be good for the game and if I do need to say anything about my ab hurting I'll say something yeah but I was like in the moment I really don't want to try and like push myself and I want to make sure that my technique is good so mm -hmm. I can limit the amount of pain that I have so then during that set, in the beginning, I was feeling really good. I went up and I took a line shot, and I was like, oh, that felt really good. Yeah. I think I'll be good for the rest of the set and for the rest of the game. And then I remember after kind of going through the front row, I was thinking I was good, but then I came back into the back row, and then the first rotation I had for the front row again is when I basically went up and I over-rotated, and I kind of felt my ab actually tear in that moment, wow. which was awful mm -hmm. and then I hit the ball like way out of bounds it was really really bad <laughs> and then I looked at my trainer and I was like I need to be taken out because I knew in that moment I basically tore it mm -hmm. and then I got stepped out and I sat on the sideline and I was just like I was pushing my body weight all the way back because I was just kind of stretch it because it hurt so bad to breathe mm -hmm. and so in that moment I was just like I think I'm done yeah so. almost like you kind of know yeah. right away and you know I think it's such a unique thing where it's like you want to be out there you know you, you actually had eight kills in that game mm -hmm. and so it's like you're you're showing your teammates, you're showing, you're showing your, your training, you're like, I want to be out there, like, I want to fight through um, what, what's going on, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it hurts. Um, you know, eventually you go into the doctors and, and they tell you you have an abdominal tear and you're going to have to be out um, the rest of the season. You know, we talk a lot about in this podcast, just like initial emotions, you mm -hmm. know, the human nature of just like the grieving process. How did that kind of take up, take about for you? Uh, what where'd your head go right away? Um, how, how, like what kind of emotions were you feeling when, when you got told that you're going to have to sit out for the rest of the year? So at first I was really scared just because I was thinking, well, if I have to sit out now, what does that mean for me in the future? Mm -hmm. And can this injury actually, um, like get solved at some point yeah. so I can actually be able to play the next year or yeah. whenever that time may be. And so after I kind of felt those emotions and I was kind of thinking, well, maybe what if I would have said something two weeks before when I actually felt that pain, yeah. like this is my fault, I'm doing everything wrong, like I could have stopped this whole entire thing from happening. So that was kind of a really hard headspace to kind of be yeah. in. And so then after that, I was talking to my trainer and she's like, you're going to be fine. Like we've had injuries like this before and they have been worse than yours before. Mm -hmm. So that kind of <clears throat> was a little bit of a positive note for me just because I was thinking, OK, well, then if I really work on my rehab and I really get back into the gym and kind of do all these little, little things that will help me kind of be best when I, and the best is needed for me, then yeah. I was like, OK, well, then maybe this injury is kind of something that is good and I think that everything happens for a reason. And I do think that injury happened for a reason for me. Yeah. And it's well, it's such a unique thing where it's like it's it's cool to hear and this is why i do the podcast as well is it's cool to hear that other athletes are going through you know injuries other athletes are going through things that keep them sidelined and it's like they've gotten through it and they've gotten back and better and it's mm -hmm. like it's possible um you talked about your mental headspace not being in a great mental headspace yeah. what are some things that you personally did um to just mentally stay locked in on rehab mentally mm -hmm. stay locked in as a good teammate um because i think if you let things take control of you they are going to take control of you mm -hmm. and and they'll always win so where did you go mentally um to just just stay level-headed uh through the rehab process I think my teammates were a really big part in that just mm -hmm. because they were always checking checking up on me every single day they were asking me yeah. hey how are you feeling this day like what have you been doing to help yourself kind of get back to where you need to be so I feel like that really helped me a lot. But then also my coaches were full support of me being able to redshirt. Mm -hmm. And they were also in full support of me making sure that I took the time that I need yeah. in order for me to get back. So I never felt pushed because I feel like maybe other places like you could feel pushed whenever you get injured. And for then sure. just like be like, you need to come back right now because we need you. Yeah. But I never felt that. And I feel like that really helped me just because I was in such a negative headspace. Yeah. And I feel like there was this one day where I was sitting in the office with Ronnie, our trainer. And I just like started breaking down and I was like, I'm not going to be back. Like, there's no way this hurts mm -hmm. so bad. I feel like the rehab is not working as much as it should be. Yeah. The medicine I'm taking is not working. And she's like, calm down. Like, yeah. You just need to take a second, breathe. Like throughout that whole entire process, like I didn't shed a tear once. And that was the first time I actually shed a tear. Yeah. And I was like, I think I'll be fine yeah. after I talked to her. Cause like, I don't even know. In that headspace, I was just it was so negative it was no, just well, so bad yeah and it's unique because I went through the same thing you know mm -hmm. second second ACL I was I remember I was just sitting on our trainer's table and I was trying to bend my knee and I couldn't bend my knee and my trainer looked at me Ryan he's like you good and I was just like boom went right head down and just mm -hmm. started bawling I was like I can't control this and I I think that's okay you know I think that grieving process is okay and, and it allows you to kind of like see through um, mm -hmm. you know you can correct me if I'm wrong but what did that kind of like 
process of, of being vulnerable and like mm-hmm. allowing emotions to flow out how did that like lead you through the rest of rehab because i think it does if, if, yeah. if i'm not wrong so for me i'm not very an emotional person yeah. i don't really like sharing my emotions with people mm-hmm. just because it's i don't know like in my head i'm just like it's my emotions so like i should yeah. be taking on my emo- own emotions mm-hmm. but i feel like in that space it was just good for me just because i don't really do that kind of stuff unless yeah. it's with my mom yeah, yeah, yeah and so i feel like that really bonded my relationship with my athletic trainer and i knew from that point on i could be vulnerable with her and i could share to her what kind of emotions were i was going through the kind of like whatever day it was mm-hmm. and i feel like that really helped me throughout the process just because like if i did feel something slightly maybe if i was able to actually pass that practice and i felt something she's like okay well tell me yeah. and so i actually did feel like i can tell her and then from that point on i feel like our connection was really high and yeah. i feel like every single day i kind of came in excited to kind of get better yeah, yeah. which is okay. really positive just because before i was just like i don't want to play volleyball like i don't want to come in yeah. i don't really want to do these kind of things because to me in my head when I was in that negative space I was like I there's really no point because I can't play for the rest of the season Mm -hmm. yeah well I think also when you get into that negative place you don't see the bigger picture you know you don't see the you don't see the finish line you see damn I gotta wake up right I gotta do this I gotta go to school I gotta watch practice like you just it can it can beat at you and it can Mm -hmm. it can defeat you mentally um you know you talk about your teammates uh, in your family and kind of being one in terms of like you know being a support system how did that help not only you um, kind of, you know, get back mentally, but how did that help the team, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of, of their success throughout the season? Because I'm sure you saw um, just the way they played and, and the way they supported you and the family atmosphere you have, like they're going to have more success right. because of how close you guys are. Kind of talk about that. So for me, I really took this whole experience as like a learning experience yeah. and a time for me to be the best team that I could, mm-hmm. especially because I physically could not go out on the court. So I really not necessarily had no choice, but I feel like it was in, it was like more of my role and yeah. I feel like each person kind of needs to know their role and that was my role in that moment in time mm-hmm. and so every single game I was excited pumped up to be on the sideline making sure that I'm screaming my head off letting my teammates know that I'm there with them yeah. and giving them as much energy as I can because I know that's what helps us yeah. along the way is like energy 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 all the time yeah. and I feel like my co- I mean my teammates really showed me that um that I'm really helping them out there and I thought that that was really good just because I was just like, well, what is my kind of new role? And I know I could be a really good team, and I know I'm supposed to be cheering my head off, but is that actually yeah. helping my teammates? And they would always tell me after the game, they're like, we could hear you. Like, you're giving us so much energy. You're doing so much for us. Mm-hmm. And then also my coaches would let me know. So that was super positive because it was like, I am here for a reason, and I am doing something that's actually beneficial. Yeah. And I know that I can't actually play volleyball physically, but I know that I can be with my teammates mentally. Yeah, and it's such a it's such a unique thing about college sports, too, and I think it's the reason why you come to Minnesota. It's the reason why you, you, know, you pick where you want to go. It's like this – if you have that family atmosphere, it makes yeah. it makes the practices, the tough practices, so much easier. You know, it makes the dog days so much better when you're doing it with people that you really care about too. And I think it's that's such a cool thing. Um, talk about finishing up rehab. You know, you're coming into the end of rehab. When did that kind of process go? When did you kind of start feeling better? And you know, what plans did you have for yourself? Because I think a lot of times we've talked about with athletes on the podcast is like, you know, you want to get back to where you want to where you were, mm-hmm. if not better. Um, did you have that mindset or was it kind of like, I'm just going to keep inching along or how did you kind of, you know, flip that mindset when you were back on the court again? It's like, I'm going to be a beast again and you guys are going to, everybody's going to see how, like how good I am, you know? So I think when I went home in December, I think in December was kind of where the uh, time of the, like my healing process is where I actually started feeling a little bit more better and yeah. where I could actually go to practice and maybe I could take a few swings. Mm-hmm. And so then in the spring, when I came back after that break, <clears throat> I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. These are my goals that I'm going to set for myself. And then I also talked to my coaches and I was like, this is where I think I can be. And can you be the ones that would help me kind of get to that step? And so I feel like right when I came back, I was like, this is my time. Mm -hmm. Like I've had enough time sitting out. I'm not going to be sitting out any longer. Like I'm going to take my rehab super seriously and I'm going to make sure that I warm up my ab every single day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use ice. I'm going to use heat. I'm going to use every single little thing that I need to make sure that I am. It would be at 100 percent. And I just took that and I ran with it. Yeah. And I think it's such a it's such a unique thing when you can have that trust in your coach where it's like, hey, this is this is where I'm at. This is where I want to get. Like, Mm -hmm. are you on the same page as me? How can we get there? Um, And, you know, it worked for you. You know, you open up the the 2022 season uh, against Baylor. Uh, you have 15 kills to open up that um, open up that one. Um, take us through just playing again. You know, we talk about obviously the emotions that you go through with injury, the emotions of not being able to play. But there's also a lot of emotions when it's like I'm back on, you know, I'm back on the court. Take us through that first game against Baylor and just how it felt to be back out there on the court again. I think it was amazing. I just took yeah. it as 
like a huge step back. I kind of just like stepped back when I really got out there. Yeah. Cause I was like, this is my time to shine. Yeah. And I've worked this hard, especially throughout the entire spring and summer to be able to make sure that I am back at a hundred percent. And mm -hmm. I felt a hundred percent, which was yeah. really cool. And so when I just first took those first two swings, I was like, like, this is me, like I'm back. And I felt that was super cool. My teammates were hyping me up. Mm -hmm. They were letting me know that they're there with me yeah. and that like this injury is not necessarily in the past but it kind of is in the past just because I'm not going to be able to feel this injury again, I don't believe. Yeah. And so it was just an amazing experience, honestly. Yeah. And, and that just that, you know, feeling of overcoming something. Yeah. Um, obviously, you can overcome many different things throughout a season, adversity and that kind of thing. But um, especially when it's something that sidelines you for so long and it's yeah. like there's doubts, you know, doubts mm -hmm. creep in. You know, I'm sure you had the same thing and I've felt it, too. It's like, am I going to be the same player? Will I be able to do the same thing? Um, and it, you kind of prove it to yourself uh, that, that you are. You're named MVP of that Big Ten, Big 12 challenge. Um, you know, you, you just, you, you're finding your sweat, step back again. You're mm -hmm. finding your swag. Um, take us through kind of, take us through the Big Ten schedule. Tell us, everybody, what it's like to, to not really have a night off, mm -hmm. you know, to, to go play Ohio State and then Nebraska and then Wisconsin. Like, the grueling process that it takes to win games in the Big Ten? So I think it's really hard, honestly, just because mm -hmm. I feel like now every single team that we play is really good regardless of who they are, yeah. and they're going to bring their best game to the table, and it's not – we don't really have time to kind of doubt a team or kind of set an expectation for that team, mm -hmm. and we can't really say, like, oh, we're going to beat this team in three because of their record maybe last year or maybe two years ago. Yeah. That's just not a thing anymore, and I think that we need to make sure that we all come into the game – knowing exactly what our assignments are and making sure that we know our scouting report to the T and making sure that we put every single little technique that needs to get us to the win is actually in place. Yeah. And I also think that we need to make sure we rely on our coaches, rely on each other because every single game is really hard. And I feel like there's really not time for you to take any plays off. Yeah. And I think that there's always a time for us to get better. And there's always a time for us to maybe implement this kind of technique or maybe do this change. And I think that you really have to be able to change really flat, fast on the fly. Yeah. And if your coach gives you information, you need to apply it right then and there. Because if you don't, the other team's going to adjust. And then the likelihood of us winning that side is very slim. Yeah, and th there's too much talent, yeah. especially in the Big Ten. You know, just looking at the way that your season shaped up, it's like, teams are just bouncing all over the rankings you know it's just it then that's just the way it goes in the league um but you guys end the year really strong you go 3-0 against Rutgers you go 3-1 at Ohio State and then you go 3-0 at Nebraska um just a great way to end the season I think you know obviously you, you you call Wisconsin your rival but I think Nebraska's kind of up there too in mm -hmm. terms of a rivalry um Take us through kind of just getting ready for the NCAA tournament, finishing up on a strong note. Uh, where's everybody's mindset? Where's your mindset just going into the, the tournament and the goals you want to achieve? Because obviously, you know, a, a national championship is everybody's goal. Right. Um, take us through kind of the team atmosphere when it comes to getting ready for an NCAA tournament. So I think that the way we ended our Big Ten play against one Ohio State and then also Nebraska, I think that – it put us really in a really good position to go into the tournament because yeah. we have so much momentum, mm -hmm. we have so much energy, and then we are on such a high from yeah. those two past wins. And so I think that when we actually came into the tournament, we all just sat down and was like, hey, this is what we want to do. Yep. This is what our goal is. And we set this goal in the beginning of the season, and we actually could achieve this at some point possibly. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like each person really took the time to like sit down with themselves yeah. and tell themselves like this is what I need to do and this is also what we need to do as a team yeah. and I feel like we really took our scouting reports super seriously in the gym we were there every single day everybody was working hard everybody was making sure that their standards are the, where we all need to make sure that they're met mm -hmm. and I feel like everybody like our whole vibe was really positive and yeah. I think our whole team team chemistry was also up there and so I feel like it made it a little bit easier kind of going into the tournament because yeah. I feel like in past years when I was here it's kind of like a hectic and everybody's super nervous yeah it comes quick exactly yeah, yeah. but I feel like this year is kind of more of a calming space which is really positive so. yeah yeah and it's you know I think especially when you you have a good year and you're a two seed um you have expectations where it's like you're supposed to make this you're supposed to do that right. and you got to take care of business at home right away exactly. first of all um and you guys do that you know you win your first you win your first two games to start out the tournament um and then you head down to Texas kind of just Take us through take us through that game against Ohio State. Um, obviously, you know you guys unfortunately lose that one, but um, just the excitement to play in the tournament and the excitement to just play more volleyball um, at a at a fun, you know, at just a fun uh, venue, you know, a fun place. It's like not everybody gets to be there. You're right. one of sixteen teams. Uh, how does how did that process go for you guys? Like the travel and all of that. I think it was really cool. Yeah. I think that all of us were super excited to go because we did beat Ohio State um, a few games past, but then also they beat us early in the, yeah. the beginning of the semester. And so I think that, I don't know, it was just like a, how do I want to put it? 
it was just like a cool environment i feel mm-hmm. like everybody on the on the plane was super excited we were all listening to music we were yeah. all like talking with each other and i just feel like our chemistry was super high and then we actually got there everybody was like okay let's go to bed making sure that we wake up early just because our game was so early in the yeah, morning yeah and then we were also all looking at our scouting reports and we all were just like the whole entire vibe of the locker room when we got to texas which is super cool yeah and i know we didn't really win but i feel like regardless i feel like after the loss we we're kind of just like well what can we do next year yeah so. no and i think that's the the mindset you got to have you know I, our coach always talks about and i've heard in the past is like it's okay to let yourself you know feel bad for a little bit mm-hmm. but but once that's over you get we always talk about you get 12 to 24 hours and yeah. then once that's over it's like you got it you got to move on you got to move out of the next one yeah. um talking about moving on uh, the university of minnesota volleyball team just announced their new coach yes. keegan cook this week um do you have a relationship with coach cook have you met coach cook i know this is kind of breaking kind of news but um you know, what are your thoughts? New coach, how's that feeling? I'm super excited. Yeah. I think he's going to be a really good part of our team just to kind of like give our our team just a different look or like a different yeah. coaching style or something mm-hmm. different that, that we haven't really seen in the past. Yeah. And so I never had a relationship <clears throat> with him before. And so it was actually my first time meeting him and okay. then actually talking to him. Yeah. So I think he's a really cool guy. And I'm super excited to get into the gym with him. Yeah, no, it's it's super exciting. I think anytime you know you can have somebody bring in new tips and tricks, yeah. uh, especially to a team that has so much talent already, mm-hmm. um, and it's got to be you know exciting for him too. He gets to go in and coach you know the best team in the country. Um, and it's definitely exciting. Talk about talk about this next year. Talk about. Um, what your guys what your plans are personally what the team's plans are uh in terms of you know a new coach because obviously it can it can be take time to get Mm -hmm. to get used to a new coach especially getting everybody on board uh but what what's what's the plan what's what's good 2023 go for volleyball look like so i plan on staying because (laughs) let's go so i really want to stay just because i do want to give coach cook yeah an opportunity to kind of like tell me what he sees Mm -hmm. that I can change that maybe be different than like what other coaches have said in the past and so I'm really excited just because I feel like he can take us to the next step Mm -hmm. and I don't know I'm just really excited for practice yeah how how much of that decision to stay leans on like teammates and the the success that you've already had here because you know I, I think the way you know especially with football and basketball is going you know if there's a new coach you're going to enter the portal you know that's just the way college athletics is kind of going Mm -hmm. but you know you you mentioned you you want to stay Mm -hmm. what kind of go obviously you know you feel comfortable here in a system and and you got to bring a new person in but what's like the biggest reasons why like hey i want to stay in and make a run for a national championship so i feel like with this team we have so many amazing parts of it Mm -hmm. and i feel like we can build upon what we already started last year and i feel like this team is a team that can get to the national championship Mm -hmm. next year for sure but then also i feel like i've made so many connections with people on the staff that are already here like for example our athletic trainer our strength coach our video coach like our assistant like there are so many people that i've already made all these connections with and these relationships with and it's just it'd be a little bit difficult for me to kind of start that whole process again and I already like the school anyways, and yeah. I think that there's so much to do, like off season, and when it comes to season, we always have so much fun. And so I just think that me kind of jumping the gun before I actually am able to actually coach or be coached by Keegan, yeah. I think it just probably would put me at a disadvantage, just because I've never actually experienced him as a coach. Mm-hmm. And so just giving him a semester, I think would probably be in my best interest. Yeah, and I think it shows recruits, it shows your teammates, like, hey, if if Taylor's on board, mm-hmm. like, why would why would we not be on board too? Yeah. And it's it's I think that's. That's the kind of you know leadership that you need from your best players. We talked about it a lot um, with with former guests too. It's like when your best player is a leader, when your best player is the one that shows up every day to work, like the team follows that kind of stuff, and it's mm-hmm. you know it, it's 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 pretty cool to see. Um, you know, you, you talk about the future of the program, um, the future of yourself. Obviously, you had you had a, you had a great year. Uh, you guys are aiming towards a national championship. Um, you know, as we wrap up, we like to wrap up each ex- episode. Um, you know, the reason why I do this podcast is I want to I want to inspire people to to know that you know adversity comes and things come up. Whether it's an injury, whether it's you know maybe a family matter, something happens in your life where adversity comes up, and you have to be able to look adversity in the face and, and get through it. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of just wrapping up. Give us, give us a little tip of advice. Maybe something you learned from your rehab process um, that you would that you would share with with a younger version of yourself when it comes to you know facing adversity. I think I would tell myself just be patient, mm-hmm. and there's really no need kind of to push myself in order for me to be this kind of player. Yeah, I feel like, and I think that me with this injury especially, it was good for me just to kind of take a step back because I really never had an injury like this mm-hmm. that would make me sit out for so long. Yeah. And so I think just taking it day by day because there's no need to rush it. And especially since I did 
or I did have the opportunity to, to medically redshirt, yeah. I was just thinking, well, this is my time just to grow and develop and kind of be this better player that I do see myself to be in this in the future, yeah. especially in terms of leadership. But then also, I feel like my trajectory of my life is not going to be a linear line. And mm -hmm. I think that there's always going to be ups and downs. And then just making sure that I embrace those ups and downs yeah. because they do set me up for success in the future anyways. Yeah, no doubt. I think we've had a lot of guys and gals on the podcast that have mentioned like, this thing is not a straight line. Right, like you don't exactly. get from point A to point B by, by walking down the street. Like you got to yeah. go, you got to go through highs and lows. You got to go through ebbs and flows uh, to get where you want to get. Um, you know, I think that that's all I got for this week. Taylor, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast, uh, representing Double Down, always making sure to double down and bet on yourself. Um, that's it for this podcast this week, December 16th. Make sure you guys stay tuned make sure you turn those notifications on we are going to be back next week december 23rd for another episode of the double down podcast we want to take thank taylor and thank Waterwave uh, for the production of this podcast and that's all we got for episode 13 it's been your boy parker fox and i'm out peace